All right, welcome to the week four of this Central Florida High School Scoreboard Show. I'm Dan LaForest. That is Baylin Trujillo and Grayson Trujillo joining us today. Yes, sir. Baylin, week four had some chaos in it. We're going to get into a lot of that. But, you know, this episode is brought to you by the Influencer Council. Everything NIL, education, implementation, follow Influencer Council on social media. Also go to InfluencerCouncil.com. Uh, also, Big Hits Live. Nobody does graphics and videography better than Big Hits across Central Florida. Balin, big week. We ought to get right into it because we had some big games. Yeah, man. It was an awesome week of high school football. Some upsets, uh, some dominating games. Um, some some crazy things happened this week. I'm very excited about this week in particular because it's Jones and Edgewater. Uh, but let's just stay on topic here. But yeah, some some big time games. I mean... We're talking the Central Florida team almost upset one of the top ranked teams in the entire country uh, on a controversial ending, which we'll get into a little later. We have a special guest coming here later as well. Um, but man, I'm so excited to talk about this past week. And then obviously the weeks to come, we've had the Orlando Touchdown Club last night. That was an awesome event. Um, some guys that won in previous weeks, like Noah Grubbs, we highlighted his performance that happened in week one, which was about two weeks or three weeks ago. Um, some other awesome talent that was there. We saw Coach Kruzik was there representing the Masters Academy. We saw, you know, Coey's head coach there with his young man, uh, McClinton, who is a complete beast. It was just an awesome event last night that we were a part of. And uh, I'm just glad the Orlando Touchdown Club has partnered with us in that and getting these kids opportunities to play in all-star games or senior year. So, um, Dan LaForest, man, it was a great week, and I cannot wait for this week in particular. All right, let's get right into it. Let's talk about the private school top five. Masters Academy goes to St. Pete. Knocks off St. Pete Catholic 20 to 18. Yeah, this was a comeback win for Masters Academy. They were actually down 18 to, I believe, zero or 18 seven uh, or 18 to three, something like that. I just know they were down early. And then the Masters Academy quarterback, Nazir McMillan, who has been dominating the last two weeks offensively, came back, led them on a big comeback win in the fourth quarter, and threw a couple touchdowns to come back and seal that 20 to 18 victory for Masters Academy, who is now given Coach Kruzik two wins in a row. So great job to the Masters Academy, and I'm even more proud of the quarterback trainee, Zaire McMillan. Number four, Orlando Christian Prep takes out Windermere Prep 28-0. to zero. They are the real deal. OCP in a third straight blowout win. They're, it's not even close, and OCP is rolling, and I love what the coaches are doing defensively. Coach Lindsey over there, a new addition to the defensive coordinator spot. He is the real deal when it comes to – DB play and getting these guys ready and motivated. He's a hype guy himself. He kind of reminds me of myself in training, especially. Uh, but then Cameron Kurz on the quarterback at OCP, the Boone transfer. Man, he is lighting it up on the ground and in the air. He's being very efficient, not turn not turning the ball over. They continue to score on consecutive drives. Look for OCP to keep climbing in our rankings in the in the uh, private school ranks and look for them to make a deep run in the playoffs. Looking forward to. They're only going to get better, Dan. I tell you what, Cypress Creek. Over at Wesley Chapel, that's the guys on the West Coast over near Tampa, takes out Mel Melbourne Central Catholic 48-26. to Man, they were watching our show last week because we were raving about Melbourne Central Catholic and about the addition of Day-Day Farmer, one of the best receivers in the entire state of Florida, came from Coco, a state championship team program last year, and they got mollywopped in this game. They, they quickly came into our top 10, and they are probably quickly out of there just because of the performance they put. Um, I, they were dominated from start to finish. I was following this game from start to finish. I, I wanted to see what Melbourne Central Catholic was about. And from the start, they just found themselves in a big hole and they never recovered from it. So uh, I don't know much about that program. I just know they have some, on paper, they look really good. Uh, but Cypress Creek in that area, not this area, dominated uh, the, the East Coast team. Now, we talked about this last week. We felt like this was going to be a big quarterback game. Toho takes out Foundation Academy 49 to 21. Savvy Messick with a big game. Yeah, I know I got some slack for this one because I did call the upset win for Foundation in this matchup. Uh, I was really riding the wave of the quarterback, Michael Dove, who also had a pretty good game in this game. He accounted for both their touchdowns. But Savvy Messick, six touchdown passes, lit it up over 500 yards passing, put himself right there in the mix of one of the top passers in the state of Florida on max preps. Like he was last year, a year ago, he was number one. Uh, he put on a performance, and that was his former school. He had transferred from foundation to go to Toho to play for Deso, which is every quarterback's dream. And, boy, they put a statement on this one and got their second victory of the year, Dan. So look for Toho to continue to move offensively. I knew they were going to score a lot of points. Foundation was doing the exact same thing. Like I said, all the starters never played a second half, but guess what? They need a lot of they need a lot of help this past Friday night to beat Toho, and they just completely rolled. So Savvy Misik 
Real deal quarterback, lit it up, six touchdown passes. And number one, Holy Trinity takes care of Palm Beach Christian, 42-6. to six. Go Charlie Brown's got these guys rolling. Yeah, Brogan McNabb, the quarterback over there, a kid that I train in the sophomore class, the 2026 power power class, I would say, for the quarterback position. And, man, he didn't even play past the first quarter. He called me at halftime was like, Coach, I'm already done for the night. And the, the score was already 42 to nothing. So, I mean, what a, what a statement they're making. If you look at Holy Trinity, they have been rolling, and they're taking care of business. They have a really good matchup this week. We'll probably talk about a little later in our prediction segment. But Trinity, uh, Holy Trinity is the real deal, and they are rolling. All right, let's get right into it. How about Leesburg taking care of Mount Dora, 49 to nothing? Yeah, no surprise here. Mount Dora is, you know, they they got caught in a in a sting fest, a swarm fest, would you say? I mean, a hurricane comes, people run away. <laughs> but Leesburg came to it and uh, and made a statement here. They continue to roll. Um, you know, I keep saying that word roll, but it, again, this week was full of blowouts, and Leesburg was a part of that. They were very excited. I know I talked to Coach Mitchell this week. They're very excited about, you know, them being in the top 10 and proving themselves. They do believe they are the best team out there. Uh, obviously, Lake Manila's hanging around. They still have the respect over there. But, man, what a statement made here. Mount Dora was undefeated until they ran into these Leesburg uh, Hornets or Bees or whatever you want to call them. They just seem to sting everybody they play. So uh, I love what they're doing over there. I I'm, I'm slowly but surely joining the hype train. Uh, they, they, they call themselves, or at least I would consider themselves, as the Colorado of Central Florida. A lot of hype around it, but like Colorado's doing in Central Florida, Leesburg is doing the exact same thing here. So they're winning, and that's all that matters, Dan. And Balin, just for the record, it's the Yellow Jacket. So, you know, we'll get going with ah, that. All go. right, let's move on. Number nine, Palm Bay Heritage takes care of business over Centennial 23 to nothing. Yeah, this wasn't as impressive as I thought. Yes, the score looks pretty lopsided, but it was only 7 0 or 8 0 at halftime. Not really impressive. And, of course, the second half, you know, Heritage, I just think, out-athlete them. But Centennial is not a good football team. And Heritage struggled a little bit there. And they have a real good test this week, which is really going to show where they are with both the programs that are playing each other. And we'll talk about that later. But, yeah, Heritage not so impressive here. But they got the win and there's another shutout win. They haven't given up a touchdown yet this year, which is the coolest stat line of all this. So continue to roll, continue to win, which is all that matters, whether it's one point or 23. But to be impressive and to move up in our rankings, you're going to have to dominate the teams that you're supposed to. All right. How about Winter Park going over and playing Boone? The number eight team takes care of business, 41-21. to 21. This score was a lot more lopsided than the game was. I talked to Aaron Williams after the game. He's a kid I trained, the new quarterback transfer at Winter Park, and he lit it up. He had a great game, over 200 yards passing, four touchdowns. But he did say it was a grind, and Boone had opportunities to actually, you know, make this competitive. It was close at halftime. They were actually up, I think, early in the game or tied it 7-7 or went up 14-7, but – yeah, Winter Park, just if you look at them on paper, they are well coached, just like Boone is, but they have so much talent over there. And if when they come together, they're a scary football team. And that's what happened here. And it ended up costing them in a 20 to uh 20 point victory here for the Wildcats. All right, let's talk about number seven, Jones, back on the, the winning side, 28 to 20 over Osceola. Yeah, we just talked about, you know, the the closest or the lopsidedness of score, right? Winter Park score was was a lot more lopsided uh in that victory, but this one was a lot more close than it really was. I mean Going into the fourth quarter, Jones was up 28 to 7 uh, or 28 to 6, very much in control of this football game. Yes, Osceola had a couple late touchdowns, uh, but when you looked at the stat line, and I rewatched the game, Do Jones pretty much dominated on all three phases of the game offensively, defensively, and as special teams. They had a kickoff return to start the second half, which got things really rolling. Um, but from start to finish, I think Jones really had their number. And this is a respectable score. Osceola is no slouch, as we've seen. Uh, but again, this game was a little bit closer than what I saw, at least with my own eyes watching the game back. So great job to Jones. Finally got in the win column. We did predict it. John predicted last week. Someone was going to get a W this week, and it was Jones Tigers. All right. Number six, Apopka comes from behind, takes care of Dr. Phillips, 18 to 14. I was completely shocked with this score. Um, Dr. Phillips was actually up 14 to nothing early in this game, even at halftime. I was with Tyson, the quarterback, Davidson, on my way to Miami for a trip. This weekend for the Texas A&M game, and I got much more of the storyline here. He didn't even play a single snap in this game, was told to undress before they went on the bus. And so he didn't even play in this game. And it, it was from start to finish pretty much dominated by the Panthers. But it was all Pop Blue Darters in the fourth quarter. And, yeah, Grayson, you weren't the only one crying that night. Trust yeah, and Grayson me. didn't like it either. I can tell Grayson was not happy with that. Absolutely. All right, so number five, Lake Mary takes care of Oviedo, 46-17. Lake Mary continues to roll. This is a two-game losing streak for, for Oviedo right now. 
Yeah, Lake Mary is the team that finally got a chance to play. They had a bye week early in the season in the second week, and they rolled second half, scored 30 unanswered points after being down 17-16 to halftime. Jackson Latour took in a game leading uh, touchdown right before halftime on, a, on an option play, and I watched the entire game from my house because I was on dad duties like I am now. But, um, but yeah, just Noah Grubbs, four touchdown passes. It's hard to stop an offense that's rolling. Carson Henshaw is, is the real deal. If you haven't seen this kid on tape yet, obviously we, we, some of us know who his uncle is. He's the offensive coordinator at UCF, Darren Henshaw. But this kid is fast, and he scored all of Noah's four touchdown passes um, in this football game. And a lot of people are going to sleep on that kid. So he is explosive. He catches things. Uh, he catches everything just like Logan Cook. Just like uh, Harsberger, who we really haven't been talking about in the first two weeks, I'm excited for when this team gets rolling, they're going to be scary, uh, Dan. And and like I said, look at this score. It, it's a complete blowout. All right, West Orange goes over to Edgewater, and the Eagles take care of business, 27-13. to 13. Yeah, Edgewater, they just they, they dominated this football game. This score was a lot closer than it was. Edgewater, yes, we know people were crying this game. It's okay, buddy. Um, but yeah, West Orange, uh, they, they had a late touchdown, uh, to keep this re relatively close, but yeah, Edgewater dominated. They were up 27 to seven. Michael Clayton, the quarterback over at Edgewater, he lit it up in the first half, made everything look pretty easy. Um, I'm, I'm just wanting when, I'm just wondering when this West Orange offense starts really clicking Dan. And I think that they're still a really good football team. They got to figure some things out over there. I think when Jack Riley finally gets comfortable in the new system and the speed of the game, they're going to be just fine later on, which is what really matters. They've got really good tests early on with Apopka and now obviously Edgewater. But Edgewater, we're going to see how they are this week, Dan. Now, we talked about this game. This was one of these games that was going to test both teams. Seminole goes down to Treasure Coast and and just lets it slip away 14-9. to nine. Yeah, man. That, this was a shocker, in my opinion. I did call Seminole to win this football game, and – you know, Treasure Coast is the real deal. I, I, I was not convinced. I mean, yes, they blew out a Jesuit team by 40. Yes, I said 40. Um, but, man, when you beat Seminole, you're you're special. And look for this Treasure Coast team to make some type of crazy run. They do have Coco in a couple weeks. Now that game just got magnified even higher, just like the Coco Seminole game. So, you know, I'm very curious to see how Seminole responds this week against, a you know, a, a depleted Evans team that just lost their first matchup. But, I'll tell you what, this Treasure Coast team is something you want to pay attention on the East Coast, that's for sure. All right, number two, Coco goes down to St. Thomas, and this is a heartbreaker. St. Thomas Aquinas takes it 37 to 36, and we're going to have John Santucci from the USA Today coming up here in the next segment. This was a heartbreaker for the Jones Tigers, but let me tell you something. They played their butt off. Yeah, I'm going to leave this run really for John because he's got really the details. He was actually covering this game on the sideline. This game made so many waves that other media outlets that were in uh, like like surrounding areas covering other football games were leaving at halftime of their games to come watch the ending of this football game. And it was all Coco. Yes, it was a it was a it was like a heavyweight matchup back and forth. But the what's more impressive is a 2026 quarterback in Brady Hart threw five touchdowns and almost 500 yards against this St. Thomas Aquinas team that is able to recruit heavy D1 athletes. And that's all they played all night. And they made it look easy offensively. And I can't wait for you guys to talk a little bit more about this and the controversy that happened. In my opinion, this score was 36 to 34. I don't know. I, it's just like a little asterisk at 37. Uh, but Max Preps does have the win going St. Thomas's way, just like those refs who got paid pretty well. Anyway, side note. But, uh, yeah, crazy game. Coco deserves the win, but they end up getting the L this week. All right. Daytona Beach Mainland goes up to Bartram Trail up in Jacksonville and escapes 28-24. to That's a good word, escapes. They were down pretty much the entire game. They were going back and forth. Another heavyweight fight. Um, and then uh, Mainland got a late touchdown to take the lead 28-24. And, unfortunately, Bartram Trail was on the other break of a heartbreak like Grayson seems to be putting on right now. So, <laughs> um, a lot of people, again, were crying Friday night, whether it was blowout wins or, or close matchups. But, yeah, Mainland took care of business, and they stay at, uh, at the top of our list at, in Central Florida. No doubt about it. Well, guys, I was at the uh, Coey Evans game, and I tell you what, that was a barn burner. A Coey comes out. We're going to watch a quick interview I had with the head coach of a Coey, Buck Gurley. When we come back, we've got John Santucci from the USA Today. You're watching the Central Florida High School Scoreboard Show. We'll be back right after this. Hi, we're here with a Coey head coach, Buck Gurley. Big win over Evans. 
big back. You know, we've been talking about the backyard brawl all week. You guys win it 17 to 8. This was a physical game. Yes. I'll tell you what, um, our offense came out in that second half and really showed us that we can run the ball whenever we're ready to. Um, the progression for us has been great. Um, defensively, of course, you know, they've always been the talk of um, O'Court. And right now, that came out that second half and really stood up. Um, so congratulations to those boys. But um, offensively, man, we really showed that we can run that ball again. We're just going to take it day by day. You know, let's talk about where you guys have come in the first three weeks. Obviously, tough, tough loss in the opener against Apopka but it just seems like the momentum continues to build. Big win last week against Wakaba. Now you go uh, with Evans. You've got Olympia next week. It seems like your team has gained a lot of confidence here as the season continues to roll on. You know what, it, it's a bunch of young guys playing football. And, and here's the thing, you can't tell them not to when the energy is so high. Uh, you see it in practice, man, the energy is always high. It's very competitive in practice, which I love. I think right now we're probably going to dummy it down because the game is on Thursday. So we, we they're going to be they're gonna be a little bit disappointed when they find out we're going to come out in helmet. So, yeah, we're going to have to dummy it down a little bit. But, man, I, I like the way that they're firing and practicing the shows in the game. Well, I'll tell you what, everything looks really solid going into next week. Good luck against uh, Olympia. Yeah, hey, I appreciate it. All right. All right, welcome back to the Central Florida High School School Board Show. I'm Dan LaForest, Balin Trujillo, and welcome back. John Santucci of the USA Today. John, a lot of disappointed fans over on Coco right now. Oh, I thought you were talking about my Bills hat. There's a lot of disappointment there, too. Um, yeah, 100%. That was uh, – Go Dolphins. Uh, yeah, no. But, uh, you know, look, it, it was um, – personally, to me, it was as bad a, a, an officiating crew uh, as I've seen, especially the way the game ended. I, I've said this. Dan, you and I have talked several times. Um, you know, two things. One uh, – I was at the game. I've seen, been covering football for almost 25 years. And the statement I kept making to you is my eyes do not understand what they just saw. Um, and here we are a couple of days later and it still doesn't make sense. But I've said it this way. I don't think Aquinas cheated. I absolutely believe that Coco got cheated um, by the referee. So you, you want me to just break it down? Like wh what happened or how do, how do you want to go through it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that because, you know, my comment is this, you know, and, and everybody's read your stories. Now everybody's seen everything online. At the end of the day, we have to understand that this game is human and um, you know, there's going to be mistakes, but what really triggers me, this wasn't about a mistake. This was about a series of mistakes. And I am one that people who know me know I will defend head coaches. I will defend referees till my till I turn blue in my face. But this is a scenario that whatever happened down there was a series of mistakes that cost a team a win. And yeah, look, that's the issue sorry. I have. There's only two options, right? Um, one is that they are incompetent and they don't know the rules, which is a big problem. Uh, option two is that they cheated. There's no other option. You can make mistakes. They usually don't happen. And I'm being generous when I say this. I'm going to say five to six major mistakes, if you want to call them that, with the clock um, or with the rules um, in the last two minutes. And every single call went towards the team that was losing. Um, at some point, it's not a mistake anymore. At some point, it feels it feels blatant. Right. Obviously, well, I don't know. I don't know that anybody cheated. Well, um, let's, let's break. Yeah, yeah, let's break down that last minute and and what, 38 seconds. You know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the 216 because that's when it all started. So Aquinas gets his last gets a first down with 216 left. They get it over the middle. The ball is set. The uh, the ref is set on the sideline. The clock should begin running once those things have happened and the clock is not running. And Aquinas is. Uh, somebody from Aquinas is shouting instructions to the quarterback. They're still looking over to the sideline, and the clock is not starting at all. And probably, I wrote in the story five to seven seconds, that's a minimum um, that didn't come off the clock because they did not start the clock when they were supposed to. So uh, uh, Coco's coaches are responding to that, literally screaming, why isn't the clock running? The clock should be running. The clock should be running. I think that contributed to what happens later on, so I think that's important to note. So... Coco stops them um, on the uh, the next four downs. They're celebrating. They're coming off the field. The fans are chanting. It's a really cool atmosphere. And I want to add this, too. It's one of the best high school football games I've seen in a very long time. 
Um, but it looks like Coco is going to get out of there with a 36, 34 win. Well-deserved win. Um, and on first down, so there's 128 on the clock on first down, Coco snaps the ball. Brady Hart, who we've talked about before is a phenomenal, smart young quarterback does not go down right away because he recognizes that Aquinas is not, they're not going to pursue him. So he just very slowly takes the ball, stands up, takes a couple steps backwards. And again, slowly kneels down probably a good five, six seconds came off the clock, but even I, I think I wrote four just to be conservative. Um, unfortunately for Coco, the clock stopped at 127. Literally, the clock operator at the snap went bang bang. Um, and the clock was not moving during almost all of that. You can see it on the game film um or on the TV coverage of it, where the clock's not moving, but he is. And so Coco's coaches are freaking out about that. They're like, why is the why was the clock stopped? There's no way that took one second. They flag Coco for a 15 yard penalty. So now it's second down. And, and that that wasn't an issue because Aquinas, according to the officials, not the scoreboard, the scoreboard said they had no timeouts left. The officials said they had one left um, and they took their timeout right then. So they're only one second has come off the clock. Second down, Aquinas is out of timeouts. Coco, again, Hart, very smart, bleeds the clock, goes down. While he's down, he gets hit. And they immediately uh, whistle him for a uh, late hit. They move the ball up 15 yards, and the referees declined Coco's pleas to start the clock. Clock should not, just for fans that don't know, a clock should not stop on a defensive penalty in that in that spot because if it was, there'd be no such thing as a victory formation. You'd just destroy everybody in front of you to stop the clock. So the referees refused to start the clock, which is absolutely what they should have done. So instead of snapping the ball, and we did the math on this, um, they should have snapped the ball for third down with 39 seconds left on the clock, and they would have been able to run out the ball on that play. Instead, they snapped the ball for third down with 121 on the clock. So now they can't run out the clock. So they they punt the ball away with 30 seconds left, and Schneider, Ryan Schneider was fuming, rightfully so, um, because mathematically, there's no way Aquinas could have gotten the ball back had the had the officials not intervened in the way that they did. So they punt the ball, and immediately as the ball is punted, they throw a flag in the backfield, which is where they would throw a flag for too many men on the field. And um, replays show. I've told I've been told by a couple people I haven't seen the replay of live. I've seen the stills. Um, the replay that I've talked to some people said there were 14 Aquinas players on the field. What I know for a fact is there were 12 blocking during the play. So some I've heard, I've heard some referees argue, well, if a kid's running off the field, we're not going to penalize him. If that's the case, whatever. But when there's 12 on the field blocking 11, that should be called, you know, because that's a rule. And, um, they uh, they looked at where Aquinas returned the ball to, which was the Coco 39, and they waved the flag off. So at this point, Schneider actually walked onto the field to try to talk to the official to understand why this was happening. And the official would not listen to him. And at that point, Schneider has a decision to make. Do I argue this, move Aquinas 15 yards closer to the end zone and possibly get kicked out? Or I do, do I just walk back? He walked back to the sidelines. I don't know what else he's supposed to do. Um, Aquinas throws the ball down to the two. Really nice catch by Chance Robinson at the two-yard line. Again, if you watch the film, the, he caught the ball, and the clock is stopped for the first down with 14 seconds left. I'm just going to put it to you guys, see if you can figure it out. By the time all the Aquinas players got down on the ball, the ball was set, everything else, guess how much time was on the clock? One second. 14 seconds. 14 seconds. The clock did not move at all until Aquinas snapped the ball. Yeah. So, again, Aquinas players didn't do anything wrong. They're just playing the game. But, um, you know, they, they run a play to try to put the ball into the middle of the field. They couldn't. And they kick a field goal with six seconds left, and they win the game. And um, personally, I've seen a lot of – seen a lot, right, do, covering this. I've never seen something that was so – you're literally playing 12 on 11 and, and probably more because of however many officials there were on the field. Maybe it's like more like 18 on 11 and then the clock operator. So let's say 19, but um, it, it was bad. It was bad. And, and I, I've I said this 
uh, Dan, to you on on Friday night. I feel bad for the kids on both teams because they played a great game, and that game is going to be forgotten because of the officials, and that should not be the case. I feel bad for Aquinas. They didn't do anything wrong. They played a game. I feel bad for Coco. They absolutely got cheated by the referees. There's no other way to describe it. Um, and I feel bad for, for the game, for the sport, because now we're talking about this and we're not talking about great football. And that's that we shouldn't be having this conversation five days later. We should be talking about, oh, my gosh, Brady Hart looks amazing. And Javon Boggs is doing things that we have not seen in a really long time against elite power five guys. And we're not talking about Jordan Lyle is going to Ohio State, you know, the, how, how well he plays. Or We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about the officials. And that's that's not good. Well, there's a couple things I do want to talk about. And first and foremost, um, and, and Balin, I know you're aware of this. Um, the FHSA, they did appeal the FHSA. The FHSA took their hands off of it. Um, but, you know, there is going to be some additional discussion within the referee group, right? And, and I know, I don't know if you have any additional information regarding the Broward County Official Association. I don't know about that. What I do, uh, I don't have anything. Certainly not on the record. Um, but what I what I can say that we and we reported this today. This is the second week in a row that a Broward Football Officials Association crew, not the same crew, but a, a BFOA crew, has made decisions late in the game from a not a judgment call standpoint, from a you sh- you should know the game of football standpoint that has cost the team a game. Uh, two weeks ago, Monarch was winning against Atlantic, held on fourth down. Uh, their offense is coming on the field to kneel down. They're celebrating on the field, and the referees say, no, it's fourth down for Atlantic. And what happened was they gave them a fifth down, and Atlantic won the game. Um, the the issue in question was on third, the original third down. I don't know how you want to do the math on that. On the original third down, um, the Atlantic quarterback scrambles out of the pocket, throws the ball out of bounds. They initially called intentional grounding and waved it off. And their argu- apparently the referee's decision was, since we waved it off, there's no play. Even though it was an incomplete pass. And they gave Monarch, or they excuse me, they gave Atlantic another down. Monarch tried to appeal the game just like Coco did. And they were told just like Coco, you basically, you cannot appeal the outcome of a game regardless of what happens. No, and and again, you know, Coach Roger Harriet, St. Thomas, classy organization. Coach Harriet's been amazing. You and I've known yeah. him for you. You've known him longer than I have. But, but what what Coach Schneider did, I think, was extremely classy to be able to put out on social media, calm everybody down. Is listen, that's a great coaching staff over there. I used to be part of them. I I know those guys. These are my friends. They they did nothing wrong, and I think that's very important. Is yeah, you, you know, all of this chaos. You brought up some good things. What Brady Hart was able to do as a sophomore quarterback against a high level defense with St. Thomas Aquinas is huge, and, and even the Boggs wide receiver. There's a lot of questioning why he's not ranked higher as a recruit, John. Right. He has had an amazing season so far. And, you know, I think these are the storylines that really need to be talked about. Yeah, look, Javon Boggs is playing so well that if he decided just for his own purposes to shut it down right now, he's already had a great season and he'd probably still be on the All-Area team just based on the first three weeks. He's been that good. Um, it's, a, it's a really, you know, it's a bad look. I, I And I want to say this. I, I, uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. I actually understand why the FHSA declined the, the appeal. Only in so much as you don't want to set yourself up to have 45 appeals every single Monday morning yeah. by, oh, uh, the referee's pants were too high. So we called this re- like, you know, you're going to get those. Right. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, in the case of Coco and Monarch, it's literally just the officials either not knowing the rule book or not caring. Um, and I, I think that is I think that's a big problem um, where I think Coco had a leg to stand on is when the power rankings come out, that's going to be very, very interesting. Because Coco, if they win that game as they should have on the field, then they are undefeated in a in a class that includes Florida High, which I know has a loss, but they're going to be very good. Bradford, I think they probably run the table. Uh, South Sumter looks like they can run the table if they get through this week. 
Um, there's a lot of really good teams in 2S, and none of them, with maybe the exception of Florida High, year in and year out, play the caliber of opponent that Coco does. So Coco might take some losses, but they're but they've played really, really good opposition. So then the question is, okay, did we just lose to Aquinas because of because of and only because of the officials? And now we have to go on the road in the second round or the third round, and we weren't supposed to have to go on the road. Yeah. And when we go on the road, we now have to rent charter buses because that's a really long drive. And we also have to pay for meals and all these other things. And now it's going to cost us, what, eight to 10 grand to go on a trip instead of having a gate at home. So now we're in the negative, what, 10 to 12 grand? because the officials took a win away. And I think on that, on those were the grounds that I even saw one of the Coco coaches say, you know, look, if you want to screw us, I'm paraphrasing, if you want to screw us, screw us, but don't let it count the power rankings. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we're, you know, there is a case there. I, yeah. And, and the good thing was it wasn't a district game, right? It wasn't something that was going to affect them from that uh, standpoint, from the district right. standing. I, and, and, you know, I had an opportunity to talk to coach Snyder, uh, earlier today and you know i was i i almost didn't know what to say other than the fact that you know ryan i want to let you know how well you and your your team have handled all of this yep um it, it's very difficult to know that you've gone out as a as you know somebody who's played the game right and to know that you go out and you lay yourself out there and and john you know we sat here a week ago and talked about what brady uh brady hart had to do for coco to be successful and by God, the kid did it, right? Yeah. Can we – Can I know, um, Balin, that you mentioned this, and I know you work with him, so you're a little biased, but I think it's fair. What this kid's done in the first three weeks against the competition that he's done it against, I, I, I'm trying to think of a sophomore quarterback that went to Jones, played okay, wins, plays against Venice, and is told by the coaching staff, go win us the game. We're not going to run the ball a lot. You're going to win us the game – go do it, and then go to Aquinas and say, we're putting every single thing in this game on your shoulders, and you're going to go ball out, throw for almost 500 yards and five touchdowns at Aquinas. I'm guessing that the number of kids who have ever done that at Aquinas is one. That's my yeah. guess. Yeah, and it's so, pretty hard. Um, and the kid, the kids had a total of three varsity starts. And at some point, he's going to go through the schedule and get to a district game and go, oh, not everybody has 15 Power 5 guys. This is kind of cool, right? Like, yeah. we could just get to play high school kids. Um, yeah. But what he's done is nothing short of outstanding or amazing. Pick your pick your adjective. Javon yeah. Boggs is making really, really good five-star defensive backs look really, really ordinary. Yeah. And, and yeah, uh, right now, he's currently yeah. rated as a three-star wide receiver. Am I correct? I don't know what he's right. I told, and I think I mentioned this to you guys last week. I've told a couple coaches. I said it again. I said it to a buddy of mine from a recruiting service. You can take nine stars between him and Hilson, uh, the edge rusher, and just divvy them up however you want, and you're okay. Yeah. All all Javon Boggs does is he's a outstanding route runner. He's got good quickness. He's got good short short area speed. He makes you miss. He has really really good hands. He's not dropping stuff. He's got good speed. And he's making good defensive backs look silly. And I don't know what more film he could put out there than the revolving door of guys that Aquinas tried on him that didn't work. And Charles Lester the week before, who's a five-star, and he had over 200 yards with, with Lester as the primary guy in the area. Um, there's not enough words that you can say about what Javon Boggs has done. Yeah, and I'm going to piggyback and, and I'm going to take over with about Brady Hart because I would say the same thing. And like you said, I know it sounds biased, but it's the facts, dude. I mean, the facts are the facts. There's not a single quarterback, regardless of the classification, has played a tougher three-game three, three schedule than Brady Hart has and, and what he's done in productivity in that. So right. he's currently the number one, number two passer in the entire state of Florida in three games. This has only been his third start on varsity, and it was against St. Thomas Aquinas, 
His second start was Venice, and his first start was Jones. You talk about a powerhouse programs that you ha- that you're asked to go win these games. They technically should be three and zero right now, behind the arm of Brady Hart. Let's not get yep. that twisted. Brady Hart throws technically the game winner against Jones. Yes, he had an up and down game, but he doesn't throw a touchdown in that game. They lose that game. Goes to Venice, those four touchdowns against arguably one of the best DBs in the entire state of Florida makes him look like Javion Boggs is the next five star that should be a five star. Then you go to St. Thomas Aquinas. All four or five of their DBs are going Division One. Their defensive line is going Division One, and he shreds them for almost 500 yards, five touchdowns. I took this kid to an unofficial visit to the University of Miami against Texas A&M on Saturday, and guess who was there? A lot of St. Thomas Aquinas kids, and the respect that they gave Brady there was phenomenal. I mean, I've never seen nothing like it. They knew. Wow. All the players know what happened, right? So this kid got so much respect that that day at Miami. I, it was mind blowing. I'm thinking they're going to have cockiness. They're going to talk trash. No, they they came up, shook his hand. They knew exactly who he was. He came with a cocoa shirt. If you guys saw the pictures on my social media, but they knew exactly who he was. And man, the respect that he got down in South Florida after that performance, everybody now knows who Brady Hart is, regardless of the win or loss. Yes, we know that, but people are talking about him. And I'm glad, John, you you've mentioned it several times on social media. That's really the big one in all this as a sophomore quarterback. What are we like? That's like a big headline. And then of course, Javon Boggs is going to get all the attention as well through that because he's obviously the reason why or 90 percent of the reason why he did he was successful but at the end of the day you know Brady Hart right now I got a call from Virginia Tech they're going to offer him tomorrow night I got a call from Penn State they're offering him tonight got Michigan State hit me up today about him got University of Pittsburgh that just offered him wanting to know Miami Shan Dawson texted me at 6 a.m yesterday and said look we're going to evaluate this guy we have a short week Thursday's Bethune we're going to evaluate this guy he can have a potential offer I'm taking him to the University of Florida versus Tennessee Dan LaForce will be there with me they might offer him O'Hara wants to just see him what he looks like in person I mean the the trickle down effect of what what just happened last Friday. I even texted his dad that night. Yeah, we're going back and forth, and it was it sucked that he lost. It hurt me, right. especially seeing him the next day and knowing how well he did. And they lost. His dad literally said his life is about to change even after this performance, and I agreed to it. So you know, Ohio State also Coach Dennis texted me today. So everybody's on notice about who the freak this Brady Hart kid is. And I want to give credit to St. Thomas Aquinas because I have an inside source that knows Ohio State staff pretty well, they actually vouched for Brady Hart. They reached out and said, you better recruit this kid or you're going to miss out on something very special. And they don't, and, and who knows? They might go after Brady Hart because they can recruit and say, yo, come play for us a couple, you know, a couple years. Or IMG now all of a sudden says, hey, Brady, we like what you're doing. You're blowing up. You have six Division one offers right now. It'll be a seventh tonight after Penn State offers. And, you know, who knows what his his whole story is going to be. Obviously, I want him to stay at Coco. But let's yeah. not start those those tread lines. Yeah. But I'm saying his, his life is about to look a lot different in the next couple of weeks just based off these last three weeks. And he's only started three games on varsity. So, yeah, I might be biased as his trainer, but at the end of the day, he's proven it. If you want to show that you're the real deal, let's not talk about it. Let's be about it. And Brady Hart has shown he's about it. Yeah, here's the thing, too, just for people who who have not had the chance to see him or, or, you know, just kind of get to know anything about him. He's got legit size, right? Like sometimes you're looking at a quarterback who's a sophomore and you're like, well, we hope he grows an inch. He's what, a legit 6'3 plus? No, he's um, six five. They they measured him at Miami. That's six plus. five. <laughs> six five. He's six got, five one eighty five, and he can he run. Can and he, throw and the I ball. was actually he runs a four seven forty. So yeah, that's which what, he showed that's against Venice. Great. He didn't show it against. He didn't need to show it against Aquinas, but he showed yeah. his wheels against Venice. He's got a legit arm. He can make all the throws. He put a ball up. Um, a, he put a back shoulder ball up to the sideline that was one of the prettiest high school football throws you'll see against Aquinas. Um, and he understands, too, when his guys got leverage. He understands when his guys got a defender turn around where even if he's not going to get the completion, he'll get the flag. And he knows when to throw it and where to throw it. He's making a really, really good decisions. And his progression from deer in the headlights a little bit at Jones week one to dominating at Aquinas week three that's so impressive. And by the way, this is a really good, smart Coco staff, coaching staff. If he couldn't do it, they wouldn't put it on him. You know, yeah. so uh, the they're, fact that they trust him like that fact. is a lot. Yeah, they see a lot in practice, which is obviously giving them confidence in what Brady is doing. And I'll tell you what, out of all those accolades and all those physical attributes that he's blessed with by God, the most important thing that I'm impressed with as his trainer and what I'm able to market is his toughness. I mean, if you see how many hits he took, he actually, this is this is real. He left at halftime at the Miami game because of how much his body hurt. He literally physically couldn't not, he couldn't sit in a seat. He couldn't. So he literally left at halftime with his dad. His dad felt so bad because Dawson wanted to talk to him after the game. But he said, Coach, I can't do it physically. I am hurting. 
So and, and then rewatching the game, you you will see even on his highlights that he posted on Twitter, he's getting smacked right in between the chest the head, the lower body, every single time he's delivering that football game in St. Thomas. And he stood in that pocket every right. single play making those type of throws. Andrew yeah. Ivins reached out and was like, dude, this kid's freakish. When we redo our evaluations, this kid's going to be a top star athlete, and he's just getting started. So I wouldn't be surprised be if he starts off at a four-star, off the rip, because in the next two weeks, he's going to have 10-plus offers, big high power five offers, and he's only a sophomore. So if he ranked those top eight kids that he did in the 26th class, and, I, and I'm not going to go through them because I have my own opinions. A couple of those guys I know, Brady Hart, Noah Grubbs, Michael Clayton, and a couple of the 26 guys that I know yeah. would go throw the throw with those guys that are probably better, but because they were earlier in the recruiting process right. or going through different camps that these guys are at, they get to shine early. But now there's no hiding from it. Now, you, like I said, if you want to show who you are, play good competition and ball, Brady Hart has every resume check mark. And if any, I don't, you could throw him against anyone. There's nobody playing better than him right now. Yeah, I don't said this real quick in the 26 class. Noah Grubbs has the best arm talent. I don't even know how you could debate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Brady Hart might be the best package of total quarterback that that uh, we have, not just in Central Florida, but maybe in the state. I don't get to see the whole country, obviously, but I'm trying to figure out how you can fit, put a better 2026 prospect together than what Brady Hart um, has been so far. And And the crazy thing is, man, we're three games into this. Right. And he's playing this well. Now, I don't know if the numbers are going to go up because there's nowhere really for the numbers to go realistically. But the kind of production, the kind of effort, the kind of ability that we get to see for the next three years, that's really cool to think about because he's going to get better. Yeah. Right. So and that's just with any coaching. I, I mean, even with Balin, it could get better. So um, <laughs> he didn't get that. But. <laughs> If it's not important, I just, you, know, you know, and the thing is, is Balin and I've talked about the class of 2026 is going to be really special to watch. And, and there's so much talent, not only a quarterback, but, you know, we're, we're naming off players of the week. And and I'll tell you, over half of them so far after three three weeks have been sophomores, John. And yep. they're all underclassmen. And and it's going to be exciting. And, and that's not – listen, we've got a lot of great talent right here in Central Florida and, and probably more than we've seen in a while, right? And um, I tell you, it's going to be exciting. But, hey, we appreciate you coming on with us tonight. You know, this has been a topic all week, and I'm glad, you know, the three of us could really kind of break it down for people. And, 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 you know, it's always one thing to read about it, but when you hear people talking about it, they're going to be sensible about it. Um, th there's a lot there. But we appreciate you coming on. And, um, you know, Balin and I have got to get to uh, our dudes of the week. And, and I'm going to give – there's been a lot of clues in the last 20 minutes here. Is it me? <laughs> it could be. Yeah, you it are definitely that dude, my guy. Dude of the week, right there. <laughs> All right. Where are you going to train me, Balin? I want to see what that would look like. <laughs> hey, I would make you a top prospect, brother. We put, John, you better go start every prospect week. in my house. John, you better go start <laughs> stretching now. Well, guys, we're going to take a quick water break. When we come back, Balin and I are going to have our dudes of the week. You're watching the Such Florida High School Scoreboard Show. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the Central Florida High School School Board Show. And we have to get our video up here. And here it comes. And let's talk about our offensive due to the week, Balin. Let's talk about them. Brady Hart is our defense or offensive dude of the week. The quarterback from Coco High School, the record setter. I would say he probably has every statistical record setting performance against a St. Thomas team. I don't think that coach has ever seen anything like that against his team. And he lit it up five touchdown passes for 493 yards. 
uh, with 72% completion percentage. I mean, unbelievable performance. This is a back-to-back -back week that we talk about a quarterback performance. Obviously, Noah Grubbs putting up history numbers. And then now we have Brady Hart in the offensive dude of the week. So this is awesome for me, not only because I'm their trainers, but because they're actually being productive on the field and taking care of business and doing it in a way where no one can argue it. It's it's evident, and he's showing the work that he's put in the offseason, uh, all, the, all the, the time and the effort that he's put in to put himself in this position – is showcasing, and now he's going to be one of the top name names that we're ever going to talk about all season. All right, Balin, let's switch right to our defensive dude of the week, and he comes from Dr. Phillips. Dr. Phillips, he played a big part on why they almost upsetted uh, Popka. Unfortunately, they, they didn't get the job done, but he is a special talent. Look out for this guy to make waves. Obviously, Smith, he's he's very talented. He's always around the football. If you watch the Dr. Phillips you know, team, they're very defensively sound, and he always seems to be at the right place at the right time, which is why he ends up being our dude of the week this week. But watch him really slowly take over in the recruiting trail. I like this kid, Dan, and I'm telling you, he's going to be a name we're going to talk about later on and in future games. No, no doubt about it. And then finally, we've got our special teams dude of the week, and he comes from Orlando Jones. Yes, he, oh, he returned the opening kickoff of the second half, 92 yards for a touchdown to break open the score against Osceola. Yes, again, the score was a little closer than what the game I saw and witnessed myself, 28 to 20. But opening kickoff, 93 yards to the house, opened up the scoring. Jones scored on two straight possessions after that, opened it up 28 to 6. And then the final score was 28-20. But this kid is special. Jalen Smith, he does it from both sides of the ball. Watch out for this guy. He is dynamic. Not only on special teams, but also catching the ball from 26 quarterback Darion Coleman. Well, I'll tell you what, these congratulations to our dudes of the week. Outstanding talent here in Central Florida. And we're going to have these guys every week. Well, Balin, we're going to go right into our new top 10. A lot of big games. We had some upsets. And a lot of people have been questioning our top 10 uh, here in the last few weeks. But let's get right into it. And let's start with. Our number one team, Mainland, stays at number one at 3-0 and after the win over at Bartram Trail. Yeah, you stay at the top until you get beat. That's how we look at it. Yes, I think that they're more impressive wins and losses like Coco, which could argue being the best team in Central Florida regardless of what happened. But at the end of the day, if you continue to win, you continue to stay there. So Mainland's at our number one spot. Then number two comes Coco. Again, an argument there. They could be number one, even with the loss. Asterisk win, 3-0. and uh, But at the end of the day, they didn't get the win. So Coco's remains at number two, followed by number three is Edgewater Eagles. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, you know, and you know what? At the end of the day, these guys are all playing each other. We've said this all along. Yeah, so if you're wait. not happy at a certain spot, listen, we're looking at real-time information based on what we know about teams, okay? Yeah. And we're not looking at what they did last year and everything else. Yes, correct. Right now, we feel like Coco, it's arguably between them and Mainland whether or not yeah. who is the number one team. Right now, no we're going to be in number two. Edgewater continues to roll. Edgewater is a solid team. We've talked about that. Even with Seminole. Now, Seminole dropping down to five. It's arguably, yeah. is a Popka better? Well, guess what? We're going to see here in a few weeks. We all yeah. know what a Popka can do. And the thing is, is right now, Ty Tyson Davison, they were in the single wing last week. Yeah. We didn't see a Tyson Davison. So, a yeah. Popka now at number six. Jones falls to seven at one and two. Yep. Uh, Winter Park stays at number eight. Heritage is at number nine. And again, Heritage uh, had, had a win, but we're going to see Heritage here uh, coming up. We're going to talk about our, our games here in a few minutes. And then Leesburg yes. had a big win against Mount Dora, but they're going to get tested here against Vanguard. Private yeah, school, I think, Holy yeah. Trinity is killing it, number one. Yep. Foundation, number, even yep. though they lose, they lose to Toha, we believe they're still the second best private school in the area. Yeah, without a doubt. No doubt about it. And then followed by OCP, which guess what, Dan? Like you just mentioned, these teams got to play each other. So we're going right. to find out who really is the number two spot because they've, they've argued that they're at the top of the list. So guess what? You're going to see foundation this week, and then we're going to go for our predictions in the next segment, which is my favorite. But uh, then comes to finish it out, Masters Academy at four. And finally, the everybody's favorite team to talk about on social media, TFA. They're unbeaten. They come back in our top five. But again, Dan, I want to go back to the top ten. I think the sleeper team here, the one that keeps rising, that people are overlooking – Lake Mary, they still have to play Apopka. They still have to play Seminole. Guess what? They have to play Mandarin, who's at the top yep. of the list. So, you know, they have some teams. And then guess what, Dan? 
they get to play mainland. So, I mean, you talk about a team that's going to prove themselves. We're going to see how real deal, the, you know, Noah Grubbs is, which I'm really excited about, show, put them on the big stage. But how good of a team Lake Mary really is, which they keep climbing. They're right now in our top four teams. But at the end of the day, in the next three, four weeks, they have to see a pop and they have to see Seminoles. So we're going to find out how good they are. But th that whole that whole three dynamic team right there is going to be exciting, Dan. I cannot wait. No, absolutely. I love the schedule coming up in a few weeks. But hey, we're going to take a quick break because we got about 10 minutes left in the show. We're going to get into next week's games. You're watching the Central Florida High School School Board Show. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to the Central Florida High School School Board Show. I'm Dan LaForest. That is Balin Trujillo. And we talked about matchups, and we got one kicking off right now. Foundation Academy's 2-1. and one. They're going to OCP 3-0. and oh. Private school number two, private school number three. It's time to get it on. Yeah, and the fan polls here have OCP winning this football game. And I'm very excited about that. I love, again, what Cameron Curzon is doing at quarterback, the Boone transfer. I love what they're doing offensively. And, again, I can't speak highly enough about Coach Lindsey and what he's doing defensively at OCP as a new defensive coordinator. But I also love what Foundation is doing, which is why I picked them to upset Toho last week. I love Michael Dove. I love his athletic ability to make things with his feet, make plays with his arm. I mean, if you've seen his arm talent, you'd be wild as well. And I'm going to go with the upset here for the fan polls. I'm going to pick foundation to beat OCP. I think it's a close game. OCP has walked through everybody they played so far this year. But now they have a true test. Let's see and prove yourself to be the number two team, arguably number one team in our private school rankings. OCP has done it before. Let's see if they can do it again behind a different looking foundation team that's now hungry after they got spanked last week. All right. Let's talk about... Uh... Let's talk about Mainland. Mainland has, did I get this right? Reigns. I'm sorry. The Reigns Vikings coming down to Daytona Beach to play Mainland. We got Mainland fan poll 83% to get that victory. Two undefeated teams, Balin. Yeah, I'm going to go with the fans here. I think Mainland wins this football game. They've proven it. They beat Barbton Trail. I think that they're a loaded football team with so much talent. Again, I can't pick against them until they prove me otherwise, you know. And so I'm going to go with the number one team here in Central Florida. And I think they beat Reigns up there in Jacksonville. Yeah, I tell you what, Dennis Murray has looked really good for the mainland Bucks, And, uh, you know, they got that stable of running backs. They got the st they got five running back guys running the ball back there. So they're always fresh. But Dennis Murray's done a good job running that offense. All right. This is the game I'm going to go to. We got the Heritage, uh, Heritage from Palm Base coming over to play Oviedo. Heritage yeah. is, is doing really well. They look solid. And Oviedo's on a two day two game skid. This is a this is a big game for the Oviedo Lions. Yeah, as soon as we put Oviedo in our top 10, they lose two straight to two really good programs, mind you. Yes, they they spanked Lake Brantley, put up 60 on them, but they have lost to two really good opponents and then obviously got Molly whopped against Lake Mary last week. But Heritage is one of those teams they have not been scored on yet, Dan, this year. And I'm glad that you're going to this game. I cannot wait to hear your take on both these programs, especially Heritage, who is now in our top 10. 67% of our fan polls have Heritage winning this football game. I am going to go with the fans here. I think Heritage does have a, a firepower uh, offense behind their quarterback. I do think Jackson Latour is the real deal. I love the strategy that they had in the first half against Lake Mary. They kept the ball away from the offense. They managed the clock, and they marched down the field and scored on consecutive possessions, which is why they were up 16-17 to 17, uh, going into the half. But I do like Heritage here with their defense not giving up a single point this year in three games. I just don't think that they're going to have much trouble stopping, you know, Vito, who's right now on a two-game skid, and they just got to find their identity. But don't get it twisted if this could be an upset. But I do like Heritage here. No, I tell you what, Coach o Greg Odierno over at Oviedo is a great offensive mind. And what yeah, he has done with Jackson Latour, do yeah. not be surprised that Oviedo takes a home game here. I think I think this is the point where you've got a lot of talent. Ty Hilton, you've got a lot of talent on both sides of the ball for Oviedo. I think yeah. they're going to take a stand here, and it's going to be a fun game to be at. All right. Private school, number one, Holy Trinity goes to Merritt Island, and this is a homecoming for the head coach for Holy Trinity. 
Yes, it is. It, this program knows each other well. They're literally within minutes of each other. Holy Trinity is our number one ranked private school team. They play a public school in this one, and Merritt Island is rolling. I looked at their max preps. They are doing damage, and they're 3-0 as well. Unbeaten's here. 3-0 versus 3-0. Our fan polls have really taken on the Holy Trinity train here. 68% of you guys say that they're going to win this football game, and I would agree with you. If it was a private versus a private, I think Merritt Island wins this football game. This is going to be very tough for Holy Trinity. But I think after looking at the stats and, and who Merritt Island has, I think there's a reason why they're also 3-0. and And I think they take care of business. And, and I would say upset our number one team, but it wouldn't really be an upset because, again, it's private versus public. Public schools should have the advantage in these type scenarios. Obviously, St. Thomas Aquinas is a different ball game and a different topic. But in this game, Merritt Island. And again, for those of you who don't know, Coach uh, Hurley Brown, head coach at Holy Trinity, was the head coach at Merritt Island two years ago. Took him to the state championship. Uh, also, uh, you know, as an alumnus, he was a stud. I played against him when he was at Merritt Island. All right, Leesburg, number 10 right now, undefeated. But they're playing Ocala Vanguard, and they've got a tough little guy there in Fred Gaskin. Vanguard is no slouch. This is Leesburg's first real test. We talked about a couple weeks. Eustis undefeated. Mount Dora undefeated. Uh, they molly whopped both those guys. Wasn't even close. This game is not going to be like that. 60 or um, 55% of the fan polls have Leesburg winning this game. And I love that. I love the, the attention they're getting here in Central Florida, which is why they're in our top 10. They have proven themselves. But if you really want to prove yourself, you win games like this. And I do not think they are going to do so. I hope they use this as motivation to go into this week against Vanguard, who is loaded historically as talking about a private school, right? Vanguard is the real deal. They are no slouch. I've seen them beat Jones before. I've seen them go deep in the playoffs. I've seen them go to state championships. This team produces top-level tier D1 athletes in the Ocala-Gainesville area. Leesburg is on the right track. Obviously, there is a lot of excitement there. I don't think they have enough yet to beat a team like Vanguard, but this is a really good indication of where Leesburg stands, and they're going to know who their identity is after this football game. And don't let them win this game, Dan, or there's going to be a lot of uproar about this Leesburg team, and they might have to climb the rankings because of strength of schedule in dominating fashion, but they do have to get past this week. So let's not look ahead. Vanguard is the real deal, and that's why I'm taking them. Yeah, no doubt about it. Now, remember, Vanguard gave Miami Central one heck of a scare here a few weeks ago. So, again, Coach Ed Farmer – has a lot going, but you got to give Coach Stephen Moffat a great and his coaching oh, staff a, a lot of credit for changing yeah. the culture really quick. Over oh, it's changed. Sport. They win. All right, this is going to be the big one, and you can sit here and say Jones is one and two, Edgewater's three and zero. Oh. Man, put that out the door. This is the game every year that is is going to. Balen, we talk about this every year. I mean, Jones Edgewater kind of sets the tone for the rest of the season. This is where Jones gets them back on track, where we find out how real Edgewater is all in one week. And guess what? The best part about it, these guys are district in the same district. So you can't run from each other. So you got to see each other every single year. And this is really the game that brought this show to life six years ago with Heath Ziegler and I. This was it when, when we made a statement, when I made the statement that Jones was going to be Edgewater, when Edgewater was at the top, we're talking with Christian Leary, Tommy Hill, all the top talent. And I said, Jones is going to go there and beat him. And guess what happened? Edgewater beat Jones. And that was a, a moment I'll never forget. That's kind of the introduction of me and Coach Cameron Duke. You know, I got to, you know, finally get to talk to him weeks after the game, after talking about all the controversy and all the, the heat that I got after the prediction, which is great, used as motivation. But I'm not going to fall into that trap this week. Uh, you know, there's 55% of the fan polls have Jones winning this game. I would think from, if you take the rankings out of it, I do think Jones on a pay, piece of paper has more, I, I want to say more talent, just more names that have produced uh, in the last, you know, year or so that's actually, you know, elevating themselves. Um, you know, same with Edgewater. They have arguably the best DB in Central Florida, Kai Bates, who's committed to LSU. They have a, a quarterback in Michael Clayton who's now finding himself in rhythm and starting to really let go of the ball and, and be comfortable in that system. And, of course, defensively, they're always at the top. And then Jones, Darion Coleman, he's another 2026 20, kid, just like Michael Clayton. He's at the top of the list. And we're talking about Noah and Brady and all, all these guys. Every single one of these quarterbacks – are at the top. Why? Because they produce and they are doing it effectively against good opponents. And this team and this game right here, both these teams are going to have to prove themselves. Yep. And I, I really want to go a specific way, but Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna play devil advocates here. 
I'm not picking a winner here. I want this to be a great game, and the winner will have to dictate themselves. I'm going to lay back. I don't want to cause any controversy here. Those you you know, Balin, that might be the one. smartest thing you've said all yeah, season right there. Stay out of it. I'm going to enjoy it. this one. All right, so this is a bonus game. Okoe, who has been on an emotional high the last few weeks, they travel and play at Olympia, and Olympia's got a dude. Romello Ware. Mello Ware has been the workhorse for that offense. Romello Ware is special. I watched his tape today, actually. I was literally going through Oak Ridge uh, film and watched some of his highlights against Oak Ridge, and then I turned it on last week in their win against Lake Nona. I was like, who is it? Dude, this kid, I don't care what level it is. It can be Lake Highland Prep. It could be uh, Olympia. I don't care. He is explosive, and he makes your team better just by him being out there. So Olympia is now starting to feel themselves. Yes, they had an upset week one against Wakaiva. Caught them early, right? That's when you want to beat teams early, you know. But now, now we're going to week four, week five, week six. This is when Olympia starts turning the corner. But guess what, Dan? They got to get through a defensive juggernaut in Nakoe. And I think with this player that they got, this 2026 freak that we saw yesterday at the Orlando Touchdown Club, Mr. McClinton, who was at Lake Mary last year, who's now at Nakoe making damage, averaging 20 tackles a game. He's going to be the one that goes against the Aware every single down. And I love that matchup. And defense wins games and championships. And I'm still having to go with Olympia. I think Olympia wins this football game. I'll always choose offense over defense anytime. So I'm going Olympia here. But, man, I wanted to hype this up. But, uh, Koei, this is a test. Both these teams are trying to prove themselves. And, uh, Koei, if they get past this one, they should be in our top ten. I don't disagree. Well, that is Balin Trujillo. I'm Dan LaForest. Have a safe and wonderful week four. You're watching the Central Florida High School Scoreboard Show. We'll see you next week. Dan, Dan.